Testing one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Perfect. Sounds good. Check, check, check. That's what all the bands do when they come on my show. Check one, two at the mic. One, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're familiar with that, right? Don't doubt it. Yes, I am very familiar with that. One, two. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me now? Do you know the Dave Darren Show? He used to be on terrestrial radio, but he got fired. It's over. Don't you think it's over? Aspen, Aspen, Aspen. Here comes the boss fella now. Dave Darren. Hey guys, welcome to the Dave Darren Show. This is going to be a tremendous interview. I have a gentleman who plays Captain James T. Kirk. Tiberius is the middle name for you guys that don't know the middle name of Captain Kirk. And we're going to be talking about Star Trek Continues. It's a fabulous, fabulous show. Hopefully some of you guys have seen it. Hopefully the guys that I've told about it recently have been viewing it in preparation for the interview that we're going to have here today. But I'd like to play a little introduction to get you guys a feel for the actual show, the content, some of the work involved in this. And let's listen to this, and then we're going to be talking to Vic, who plays Captain Kirk on the show. Here we go. The Enterprise is scheduled to return to Earth shortly. I always intended to bring her back in one piece. But the triumph is... Priority one. We're diverting you to Aldebaran. Romulan. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission, to explore strange new worlds. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Welcome back to the show, guys. We do have Vic Mignogna of the Star Trek Continue series. How are you, Vic? I'm good. I'm very, very good, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's Mignana. Mignana, okay. Pronoun in a pronunciation of my last name. It's Italian, Italiano. Okay. Mignana. Okay, so let's talk about Star Trek Continues. I want to capture more of the emotional feel of the program. Now, I did sense it was unusual when I first met you and invited you on the show. I knew you had some hesitation because I'm kind of a rock music interview type of personality but we always realize that rock music any type of music any type of genre is connected to human beings on a very emotional level and Star Trek continues Star Trek the original series and granted let's say them they are all connected with human beings because if you take the technology outside of humans we are left with humanity and that's what we deal with on our average daily basis. So Star Trek Continues was very much like that. When I was viewing even the first episode all the way through every episode, the emotional connection by far 
captivated us more than the actual technology did. And that says a lot because the series initially was conceived that way. So tell us a little bit about the conception of the series, et cetera. Well, you know, since my childhood love affair with Star Trek, um, it was never firing phasers that resonated with me. It was never flipping open communicators. It was never fighting the Klingons. It was never beaming down. It was the stories. It was the storytelling and the emotional impact of the characters and their relationships. And to be honest with you, that's why I think we still talk about Star Trek today. Uh, it's not because of any technical reason. They didn't win any awards for lighting or costumes or, you know, uh, VFX. But they're still remembered, the original series is still remembered fondly because of the emotional punch that it packed. The, the stories they told that had a theme, that had a point. You know what I mean? They had a, a message. They had a, a statement to make about something relevant, whether it was a social issue or a moral or ethical dilemma. That's what Star Trek did better than anything. And so when I conceived Star Trek Continues, my primary goal was to tell those kinds of stories. They're not easy to find. And in order to execute those kind of stories, you need a good script. And even more, you need actors. Not just, not just fans who love Star Trek but actors who are going to be able to play the roles and take the audience to the emotional depth that the story goes. So my original intention was always to cast actors, friends of mine who had enormous amount of experience and skill as actors. And, uh, and I'd like to say, I, 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 I'd like to think, I'm very subjective, of course, but I would like to think that, w that we did that. I'd like to think that the stories we've told have been classic Star Trek morality tales with ethical questions and moral dilemmas and social issues. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that our series <coughs> resonates so much is because it's not just a bunch of it's not just a bunch of fans beaming down. It's not just a bunch of fans fighting the Klingons. It's deeper, emotionally packed stories. Absolutely. That have themes that have themes of selflessness or guilt or sex trafficking or immigration or gender uh, um, women's rights or uh, any of a number of, of you know racism any number any any of a number of very emotional issues and and. I'm very proud of, of what we've achieved with our, with our 11 episodes. And all your fa fans are very proud of you as well. And I know because I've reached out to several of them over the past couple of days, and they are extremely honored to have your Star Trek presentation come into their homes. It, it was well, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored that they welcome us in. Yeah, they sure have. I'm very curious about this. Some of the episodes I watched of all of the other series, there were several in particular that I really thought took me to heart. One of them I'm going to mention, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about it. One of them was in The, uh, the Next Generation, when Picard is actually captured, not physically, but his mental capabilities are transferred into a world that has long since died. I think it was a thousand years. And he initially, he is not accepting of the situation he's thrown in, but gradually, of course, he feels like he's uncertain of what he, he lived in his prior life. I guess he gets a little bit more focused on the reality of where he is at the moment. And at the very end of the episode, he is brought to the knowledge that it is a recreation of this world that did not want to lose its identity. So they brought Picard into it to share their emotions and share their beings to another entity to carry their life existence beyond. The very end of that episode, when Picard goes back to the Enterprise, and he realizes that it was all reliving that moment in history of those people. The only thing he has left is beamed from the, uh, I guess it's the vehicle that captured him, the, the whatever it was, 
was mm-hmm. the flute that he had learned how to play the musical instruments. Right. And the thing that really captivates me of that is that I do not feel like it's acting at the very end. I feel like it's legitimate, sincere emotion. Now, whether they, whether they recorded that in separate sequences where the emotion wasn't there. So the, I guess the question is with you, when I watch the series Star Trek Continues, I capture your personal emotion, not acting. I, I, of course, the acting is spectacular among everyone in the cast, but your mm-hmm. emotional level connection with the product and your fans and your love of the original series is something that I don't think it could be imitated. I think it's got to be there, and I think it is with you. Well, I think that's one of the reasons that I, one of the reasons I believe people have enjoyed our series so much. <clears throat> and it's because they know we're not making money. It's because they know that we have no other motive for doing what we're doing except love for Star Trek. I mean, if you think about it, you know, there are a number of motivations that would drive people to do anything, right? Uh, The hope of money, right, to be paid well. The hope of success. The hope of more opportunities. uh, Doing a favor for somebody. I mean, there are any number of motivations. But from the very beginning, every single person, Dave, who's ever come into Star Trek Continues, I have taken them aside and I've said, okay, now let me explain this. There's no money. We can't pay you thousands of dollars. We are doing this as a love letter to Star Trek. If you want to be a part of that, we'd love to have you. But don't come in here thinking, you know, having any delusions of grandeur. And don't come in here thinking you're going to make some payday. Because that's not why we're doing it. So, in lieu of not being paid any sums of money, large sums of money, to to bring people in, the viewers can watch our shows and they know that everybody that they see on screen is there for one reason alone, and that is to give of themselves to make something special. And that, Dave... Is priceless. Absolutely. Can't put a price tag on that. It transcends money. And and I think that the emotion that you're talking about comes through in our episodes because the viewers that are watching them know every single person involved in this show. I'm not kidding, Dave. I'm talking about the not just the three or four or nine or ten people you see in front of the camera. I'm talking about the 20 or 5 or 30 behind the camera that are making all the sets and costumes and doing the makeup and running the camera and running the sound and building the props and all of the little the little uh, jobs that all these people are doing to help execute the show. Every single one of them is doing it because they care about it. And I think that's what makes the series, one of the things that makes the viewers enjoy the series so much, is that they know that it is pure love and pure emotion that is making Star Trek continues. Curious question about episode one. When you first filmed episode one, it was your initial product, your initial filming. The initial intensity of doing it was at that moment. What did you think after the conclusion of episode one? Did you think, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? It is so complex. (laughs) Or were you just thinking, it doesn't matter. I have this love for what I'm doing. It'll overcome any obstacles that are going to be thrown at me throughout the rest of the episodes. Well, let me let me tell you this, Dave. There was no intention of making more than one. I did not know that. Huh. I mean, you may not know this either, Dave, but I paid for the first episode to be made. That I knew. <laughs> that I did know. Okay. <clears throat> I did not feel that it was morally right or ethical for me to ask fans to give me money to do something that they had no proof I could do. Wow. So I thought to myself, this is the quintessential opportunity to put your money where your mouth is. You've heard that term a thousand times. This is where the rubber meets the road, right here. If this is something I believe in and I really have a passion for doing it, I'm going to buy everybody's plane tickets to fly down here. 
I'm going to pay for their hotel rooms. I'm going to pay for their food every day. I'm going to pay to have these sets built. I'm going to pay to rent this studio to have these sets built in. And I'm going to make this thing, this one time, I'm going to make a Star Trek episode as best as I can remember what I loved about the original series. And that's what I did with Pilgrim of Eternity. I didn't know if anybody would like it. And at that point, it was really moot. Because I wanted to do this to pay tribute to the show that inspired me so much when I was a little boy. Anything? Nothing, sir. I've tried friendship messages on all known alien frequencies. Ship's power now at 29%. She's fading fast. Not without a fight. Lock photon torpedo on. Dead center. Torpedo locked. Fire. Captain, I'm detecting two life forms in the center of the anomaly. Life forms? Apollo. Yes. Curious he has aged so rapidly in two years. We can't give you the worship you want. Much has changed. I no longer seek it to be a god for centuries. Only to weaken and die alone. There's no telling what he's liable to do. But can't that be said about any one of us? In each of us, there's the potential to do great things and to do dangerous and unpredictable things. How is Apollo any different? It was I who guided it into Achilles' heel. Payment for the sacrilege of murdering Troilus, my son, on the very altar of Apollo! So I did it, we released it, and the response was so overwhelming that we decided, okay, now we have a proof of concept, right? Now we have a physical start to finish product, a full length episode, not a promo, not a trailer, not a teaser, but a full length, fully realized episode, Dave, with full cast, full crew, full sets, a complete story. And so with that in our hands, having paid for it ourselves, then we launched a crowdfunding campaign and basically said, look guys, if you want us to make more, if you like this and you'd like to see more, then help us. And we, we raised enough money to make three more episodes and that's exactly what we did. Efficiently, with love and care and integrity, we released two, three, four. Then we, we launched another crowdfunding campaign and made four, five, and, and made five, six, and seven. And then with our last crowdfunding, we finished the series. And we did every single thing we promised we would do. That's extraordinary, Dave, and that's why I want to I want to point it out here. I want to I want to, you know, put a little pin in that. When we when we were when we were launching a crowd our second crowdfunder and we told the fans, if we reach this stretch goal, we'll build a planet set. And guess what we did? We built it. Yeah. And shot it. We did it. We executed what we said we would do. And I'm very very proud. Of, of not only our series and the people behind our series, but the fact that we accomplished what we promised the fans we would do. And uh, I, think that's, I think that speaks volumes of our production. Sure does. I have an, another question here. I interview a lot of bands, and they will have written that perfect song that connects with their fans and themselves. Star Trek, the original series with William Shatner, reached a level, maybe not recognized in its initial inception, 
but throughout the years, it hit that pinnacle and that nerve in people's hearts that they connected with it. And when, and when you find that nerve that's hit and that emotional connectivity, it is almost impossible to replicate that. And you replicated it with Star Trek Continues, and everyone realizes that, and I realize it, and I recognize it. Thank so you. so that, <laughs> that repetition of capturing that magic and that ability a second time is remarkable. It will never, ever be accomplished a third time. It will never be accomplished a third time. Well, I don't know whether it needs to be. Yeah, Do you yeah. Know what I mean by that? I mean, the original series was cut short, right? The original series was cut short abruptly in its third season, <clears throat> so it never had an ending. It never completed its five-year mission. The Enterprise never returned to Earth. We never knew why Kirk took a desk job and accepted promotion. We never knew why Spock went back to Vulcan to pursue the Kulinar. We never knew why McCoy quit the service altogether. There were a lot of unanswered questions in the 10 years between the cancellation of the original series and the motion picture. So my goal was to answer those questions and to fill that gap and now that we've done it, and I feel I feel really good about what we've done and how we've done it, <clears throat> I don't really see that there's a reason to do it again. But, as you mentioned, I'll use your own words, that gap was filled by Star Trek Continues. And there has been a gap for a lot of years. Now that that gap is taken away from the lack of continuing episodes of Star Trek Continues, Obviously, you realize that, that the missing of producing this show continually beyond where you left it off, that to me, if, if I had to stop my radio show, and I have a couple times out of, I, I got frustrated periodically because of, not because of the financial wealth of it, but because I wasn't getting enough people really interested in it or really connecting with me emotionally to right. make the music go from where it is now. I want to improve the music scene. That's what I do this show for. Right. Not for the money, the same purpose as you do. If this got ripped away from me and I could not do it, I would be devastated. Well, let me just say this, Dave. Mm -hmm. I poured every ounce of my skill and my love and my concentration and my creativity into Star Trek Continues. And so did my cast and crew. I don't, I don't think we could have done it any better than we did it. And what I set out to do was finish the five-year mission. I had a goal, and my goal was not to keep making episodes until I got too old to play Captain Kirk. You know what I mean? My goal was not to just keep cranking out episodes until we couldn't find any good stories anymore and our episodes were getting kind of lame and everybody was getting kind of pudgy. And you know what I mean? That wasn't my goal. My goal was to finish the five-year mission. My original goal after we got into doing more episodes was to do 13. I wanted to do one more, one more TV season. Today's TV seasons, obviously not seasons like they did in the original series era. But do one more TV season of 13 episodes. But my goal was always to finish the series. And in that respect, I accomplished my goal. I did what I set out to do. So even though I may be very sad, and I'm quite certain there will be, there is already kind of a hole in my heart because I, I poured so much passion and time and money and effort and creativity and sweat into this show. I could not help but miss it, right? I mean, I couldn't not feel that sense of loss. At the same time, I feel a great sense of satisfaction. I feel a great sense of closure because I did what I set out to do. And yeah, we were only able to get 11 episodes done, but that's fine. We still did what we set out to do. And, um, and I'm very proud of that. How long before the Hulk in prediction of galactic revolts is realized? Approximately 240 years. The inevitable outcome. 
The Empire shall be overthrown, of course. In every revolution, there's one man with a vision. Captain Kirk, I shall consider it. Commander. No weapons. He put these thoughts into that falcon head of yours, didn't he? That, that other captain. After all we've been through, all we've accomplished, earned for ourselves, you would trust a stranger from another universe? Your mutiny ends right here. What now? Peace. The Empire will hunt you down like the mangy dog that you are. Perhaps. But I must try. In every revolution, there is one man with a vision. Who told you that? You did. Stop! The episodes as they were left off with Star Trek, the original series, you, as you mentioned, you carry them through further development. When you carry them through further development, we did not only see story to carry the episode through further development, we saw character growth. Was, was that meaningful to you? You just didn't want to... Absolutely. Yeah, I noticed that very clearly. I'll tell you something interesting. I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I can certainly speak for, for my portrayal of Kirk. When people ask me what my favorite episode of the original series was... I give them an answer that they're not expecting because it's it's not one of the main popular episodes people think of. But my favorite episode of the original series was an episode called Requiem for Methuselah. <clears throat> it was in the third season, and it was when they went to they, the the Enterprise had that that uh, epidemic on board, and they went to that planet to to get the the uh, the substance they needed to make an antidote, and they found that old man living there by himself. And then he introduced them to the young girl that was his, supposedly that was his adopted daughter. Uh, and then you find, you know, Kirk falls in love with her, and she seems to be the perfect woman. She's intelligent. She's beautiful. She's well-spoken. She's brilliant. She's creative. She's talented. And then you find out she's an android. And you find out that the old man was immortal and that he built her so that he could have a mate that was as immortal and as well suited for him as, as he was immortal. What I loved about that episode was the last scene. In the last scene, you see Captain Kirk like you never see him anywhere else in the series. You see him sitting at his desk. Emotionally vulnerable. Yes. Ashamed. Ashamed. You see Captain Kirk so ashamed of his behavior. He feels so bad about how he behaved. And then he even says, you know, we put on a pretty poor show, didn't we? If only I could forget. And he puts his head down on his desk and falls asleep. McCoy comes in and Spock and McCoy have a wonderful moment. And even McCoy says, man, I do wish he could forget. And Spock steps up and mind melts with Kirk. And the last thing he says in the episode is, forget. Yeah. Now, what I loved about that episode was it showed a side of Kirk you never saw. In the late 60s, the heroes of a television show were always the heroes. They never got hurt. They always saved the day. They always made the right choice. They always came through. They were the heroes, hero, hero, hero. But as you and I know, that's not real life. All of us have failed. All of us make mistakes. All of us fall and stumble. Hopefully we get back up. But we all have regrets. We all have guilt and, and pain and shame, loss. 
And as we started Star Trek Continues, and I was dwelling on one day contemplating the episode of the original series that I loved most, the one I just described to you, and we wrote an episode based on that. And that was our fourth episode, The White Iris. The entire concept behind it was Kirk is not as unscathed and unbroken. Kirk is much more in touch with the emotions we have all experienced than we think he is. And in fact, he's got a lot of his own issues of loss and shame and pain and, and guilt about relationships from his past and decisions from his past. And he has buried those for so long. And in episode four of our series, they come rushing to the surface. And he's got to deal with them. So I say all that to answer your question about character development. I wanted us to see more of the human relatable side of Captain Kirk than we ever saw in the original series. We got a glimpse of it in Requiem from Methuselah, but I wanted to show more of that. And so for my part, that was, that was, that was something about the character of Captain Kirk that I wanted to expand upon with SGC. And on behalf of the people of Calcis, I formally agree to the- <laughs> The Retria will not be silent! Your Federation is not welcome here! Enterprise, emergency beam out now! The Federation promised us a planetary defense grid. Where is your captain? Captain Kirk is recovering from injuries suffered from the attack. I have nothing to fear. You are here. James, let me help. What's wrong, James? I, I fear your child. James, look at me. I fear James, your James, let me child. help me. I did the best I could! I can't change anything now! What do you want from me? How have you talked? How have you communicated with your fans? Obviously, the fans are very, very much in touch with every episode you've created. Uh, I'm sure they've reached out to you. Obviously, I did, and you responded to me. So obviously, you're very connected to your fans. I try to be. Yeah. I try to be. What have you got? Have you? You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm a voice actor by trade, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this or not, but I have also been a music composer, producer, singer, songwriter for twice as long. As I, since I was 17 years old, twice as long as I've been voice acting. I've got six of my own original CDs on iTunes. I've produced 20 or 30 records for different people. I've produced, written and produced hundreds of jingles and uh, themes for television and radio. Music is a very, very big part of my life. But I try to stay connected with my fans because I fully recognize that they are the reason I have a career. I, I do a lot of animated uh, shows, a lot of anime, a lot of video games, and I've had the opportunity to be a part of a lot of really popular shows. Full Metal Alchemist, Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon, Digimon, Naruto, <coughs> Final Fantasy, Bleach, uh, all kinds of stuff. And I do a lot of convention appearances where I'll sign autographs and meet the fans, and I do them because... I want the fans to know how much I appreciate that they enjoy my work. I want the chance to look them in the face and, and shake their hand and thank them for, um, for enjoying what I've done. And Star Trek is no different. I'm so enormously grateful that, that the fans have enjoyed Star Trek continues as much as they have. Um, and I want them to know that. So I try my best to, to engage with them and let them know how much I appreciate their enthusiasm and support. Okay. I'm curious about this as well. Movies are limited to two hours in production. When you have a TV series, obviously you have an ability to go beyond one, two hours, three hours, four hours. It goes on hour and after hour. 
does TV have an advantage over movies? Because obviously the depth of the characters can grow phenomenally from episode to episode, year after year. We know that from MASH. We know that yeah. comically from Cheers. TV, is that an advantage over movies, a significant well, advantage? In, in the respect that you're talking about, I think it is. I mean, how many times have you talked to somebody who, who went and saw a movie that was based on a book, and they read the book, and they loved the book, right. and they hated the movie? Yeah. And why do they always say that they hated the movie? Because the movie couldn't possibly expound on everything that was in the book. The movie has to consolidate and squeeze down into a two-hour time limit what took you a week to read. So I have a lot of friends who tell me that movies never, movies never uh, measure up to the books because they don't have time to go into the depth of character development and detail and description that they do in a book. And I would say probably... TV has that benefit over movies as well, that you can expand on characters and build relationships and grow a story um, over a longer period of time than you can in a movie. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, it's true. Yeah, so the reason I asked that too is because I listened to all the conversation we've been having here, and you said that originally Star Trek Continues was potentially originally planned to be one episode. That would well, be, I, that would I, be, didn't know, I didn't know what people would think of it. Okay. I had no plans. We didn't have a script. Right. We had no other scripts for any other episodes. We had no other plans for any other episodes. The goal was make this one episode about with Apollo and release it and see what happens. Right. I guess I'm asking that because I see from your character in the interview and the talking with you here that if it was one episode – you would not have emotionally have put your entire being. You would have needed more. So I, I don't see that one episode would have possibly quenched your desire to give the love of that series what you thought it deserved. And so that, that's why I was asking that about TV having that ability. Because obviously I think the one episode would have been very... You would have needed well, more. I mean, it would have been nice, and that one episode by itself right now has well over a million views. Mm -hmm. Our first episode by itself. And we have over 7 million combined, and I would expect that <clears throat> over time, you know, more and more people are going to discover our series and, and enjoy all of the episodes. But <clears throat> you're right. Had we only made the one, there would have never been an opportunity to finish the series. There would have never been an opportunity to bring any closure mm -hmm. to the Enterprise's five-year mission or Kirk's captaincy or Spock, Spock's mission or, 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 or McCoy's leaving the service, any of the characters. But this is a perfect opportunity for me to thank the fans, for me to thank the people who, who gave and supported us making more so that we could do what we've done. Do you have a, a favorite episode out of all of the ones that you have been part of? Uh, and that's a hard question. I know the fans are probably going to say the last two episodes. I know well, they are. A, a lot of them say the last two, but okay. I, have, I have read a lot of places where people said nine was their favorite, the one with John DeLancey. Right. I've, I've, I've read where a lot of people said five was their favorite when Kirk and McCoy went back to the Civil War. Hmm. I've heard people say four was their favorite, the White Iris, which is which is very close to my heart emotionally. I've heard people say three was their favorite because they loved the mirror episode of the original series and they loved seeing that continuation. I what I love is you can find lots of people who think it, who 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 all have different favorite episodes of our series. I know that I'm partial, but I don't think we have a clunker. No, you don't. Clearly series. you don't. You know what I mean? Like some would even argue that there were some clunkers in the original series. I don't think we have one. And and I'm I'm very humbled and honored that so many people love so many different episodes for so many different reasons. For me, 
there is a very special place in my heart for, for episode four, as I mentioned, for the reasons I mentioned. But I'll be honest with you, I have been so intimately involved in every frame of every episode, everything from choosing fabrics with our wardrobe supervisor to work building the sets and building props with our props team and set team to choosing makeup colors and wigs with our makeup people to script writing and editing to editing the episodes after we shoot them. Sometimes I've directed the episodes. I've cast all of them. I've had my hands in every element of every episode. So trying to ask me to pick a favorite would try and try to be like asking, you know, Jan, asking uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brady which one of their kids is their favorite. You know, I mean, you you love them all and for different reasons, but um, there's something special about every one of them to me. And uh, so I, I don't know that I could I could say this one's my favorite. Like I said, I do a very special place in my heart for four for the reasons I mentioned. I do a very special place in my heart for 11, mm -hmm. for 10 and 11, for the reasons, obviously, for the, the sense of closure uh, that, it, that it brought to my favorite show of all time. Yeah. But apart from that, I don't think I could pick a favorite. I'm still waiting for an open transporter window. Without a window, matter energy beams to the surface are automatically scrambled. Scrambled? As in turned into a pile of mush? Ah, there's a green light. Energize, please. But our eyes have been affected during transport. Greetings are normal, Jim. Greetings. Welcome, my friends, to Hyalinas. Please, come. The inner council is waiting. Can you explain our vision? In fact, I can. An unusual form of radiation emitted by their sun. Everything looks... So the cause of the illness and the monochromatic vision are one and the same? It took a millennium or so for the star's radiotoxins to reach levels high enough to induce acute radiation syndrome. If we modify your star, you'll see your world in a whole new way. And based on what we've just witnessed, I'm not sure you're ready for it. There's an old saying, a ship in the harbor is safe. But that's not what ships are for. It's magnificent. Long have I wanted to tell you. This is all been a lie. No, no. I'm still me. My love for you is not a lie. I'm still the same person. Even with new vision, do you still not see? Captain, commence the decontamination sweep of Hyalinus. I'm afraid we won't have the time. You would let us all die? We fixed your son. And they have the ability to sweep the residual effects of the radiation from both worlds. Has it ever occurred to you that their civilization could be suffering the same fate as yours? They are what you would become. Please. Don't make us beg help from them. There is no them anymore, my dear. Only us. Now, you know, as I watch the episodes, I'm more focused in and watching the, the action, capturing the emotion, and I don't really look at the credits that thoroughly. So I'm curious about this. In all of the episodes, you had various writers, or for instance, the, let's talk about the very last episode, which was the <laughs> critical connection between where Star Trek never left off and where you connected it to the first movie. Who wrote that episode? How complicated was to write that? <clears throat> well, you should, uh, you can thank uh, the amazing skills of Rob Sawyer, a very well-known, celebrated sci-fi author. Um, Rob's a, a fan of our series and a friend of our production. He actually came down and played a little cameo in one of our episodes. I think it was four. Not sure. Maybe. And, uh, and he stayed in touch with us, and uh, one day he contacted us and said, hey, if you guys ever have a, a story you'd like me to write, I'd love to write an episode for you. 
excuse me, and I said, uh, and we said, sure, we'll keep that in mind. And when we realized that we were going to need to be winding our series up, and we always wanted to do a two-part series finale, from the moment we talked about a series finale, about bringing our series to an end, we'd always wanted it to be a two-part series finale. So um, James Kerwin and I sat down, and we talked about what the story would be, what the basic story would be, what the basic premise would be. And then we wrote it out, kind of an outline. By the way, it wasn't so basic. There were a lot of, a lot of there, that was not a basic episode. There were a lot of points no, in that. No, no, no. We, base, we gave Rob Sawyer a basic idea of what we wanted. For instance, we want to see certain things happen. I knew we needed to kill McKenna. I knew I wanted to kill Drake and McKenna, and I knew that this had to happen and this had to happen, and I wanted to see this, and I want to see this, and I want us to do this. Now here, you <laughs> organize all that into a great story, and that's what Rob Sawyer did. Rob Sawyer wrote the screenplays for 10 and 11 based on the, the basic outline that James Kerwin and I gave him, and then he gave us the scripts back, and we would do what Gene Roddenberry did. He would edit the scripts. Yeah. He would edit some of the dialogue, and he might move this scene here, or he might give these lines to this character, or he might rewrite this section a little bit more to, in, to keep in with his vision. But for the most part, it was a collaborative effort. 10-11 was a collaborative effort between Rob Sawyer and James Kerwin and myself. Excellent, excellent. I'm curious about this. Early on, if you can think about who your first viewer was, is it possible? Did the technology allow you to see who? It's almost like when you open up a business, you get you get the first dollar bill and you hang it up on the wall. Ah, Were you, I wish I knew. You, you wish you knew. I figured you wish you knew. I wish I knew because I would send them a, a cookie gram. <laughs> How about... A cookie bouquet. How about your first subscriber on YouTube? Did, could you track I that? Have, no? I have yeah. idea. I don't know. Okay. How about, the, know. how about the first critique you got? There will always be someone who finds a critical element in anything, whether it's a well, classical you know, Beethoven piece of let music. Me, let me say something, Dave. Okay. There are people out there who define themselves by what they are against. Yeah. They literally define themselves by being against things hmm. and and taking a taking a an antagonistic challenging criticizing view of anything they don't like how do you especially, how, how, especially let me say this uh -huh. especially if it's something that a lot of people do like thousands and thousands of people talk about how much they love this movie or they love this TV show or they love this song there's always going to be a few people like, I thought it was stupid. I thought it was dumb. Because they're so desperate to differentiate themselves from the pack. They're so desperate for attention that they will literally take an opposing view, even if they liked it. They would never say that. Because they are desperate to differentiate themselves from, from others. And here's what I think. That's unfortunate. That's sad. And I would encourage those people to go and make their own thing. And then find out how difficult it is to actually accomplish. And this is the other thing I would say about criticism. I don't look for it. I don't seek it out. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that think I'm a horrible Captain Kirk. And they don't like what I did with it. And they think it's stupid, and it's a dumb fan series, and it's lame, and nobody can act with their way out of a paper bag, and the stories are crappy, and fine. God bless, you know, live and let live. If that's really what they want to say to bring joy to their lives, if they really genuinely believe that, that's fine. Here's all I know, Dave, is I did the best I could. I... I had an idea, and more than have an idea, I executed the idea. 
And there is a great ocean of work between having an idea and executing an idea, especially one at this level of complexity. And people like Lisa Hansel and James Kerwin and Ralph Miller and Matt Busey, Ginger Holly, Hannah Baruki, Michelle Specht, Randy Mahara, Chris Dewin, Todd Habercorn, Chuck Huber, Kimmy Stinger, uh, Will Smith, Royal Weaver, Sam Rooks, uh, John and Kat Roberts, Wyatt Lenhart. The list is long. Um, we came together and we made something that literally hundreds of thousands of people are enjoying. And for those that don't enjoy it and have a critical word, so be it. God bless them. Approximately 70 years ago, Orion women held dominion over the men. But in a revolt and after a civil war, the men gained control. Rather than abolish the slave trade, they continued it and, in many ways, made it worse. The women are bred with no education or opportunity, in part to keep them subservient and in part out of revenge. The girl was the property of one of the Tellarites at the time of their death. She was wounded in some sort of assault. The bruises on my body are not from the Tellarites. Zamenhan beats his slaves. I could be the voice for women who have none. Not if you send me back in chains. All right, gentlemen, are we ready? Energize. And even without the knowledge, education, beauty, talent, she is still a woman with a fundamental right to be free. We're not going to change each other's minds over a fine dinner. With your permission, Captain, I'd like to take my leave and return with my... Lonani. regret the day you ever imagined yourself as anything but a slave! <laughs> and then, this Earth's costume changed into covering the chained one underneath. <gasps> and you'll be punished until you can wait your place! Leave me out! Reveal to them the animal you really are! What, what do you think about the human race, the direction that we're going right now? Do, do you take the optimistic Star Trek co concept that we will overcome? Do you, do you subscribe to the Star Trek original series? I, I think, which one was it where there, it, I guess it was in one of the movies where there was a devastation of the human being and then Zephyrin Cochran created the uh, first warp drive and, and things got better from that point. Where do you think <coughs> that the human was contact? That was that was Star Trek First Contact. Yep. Okay. Where here's, are we going? Here's my answer. Here's my answer. You you ready? Yep. Ready. You may, you may not have been prepared for this one. I, I like being unprepared for qu question and answer sessions. It's good. I am a Christian. I am a believer in Jesus, and I make no apology for that. However that impacts my worldview or my view of the, of the future, you, you all out there can, can decide for yourselves. But let me just say this. As much as I love Star Trek, as much as I love the optimistic values and the optimistic future of the human race that is espoused in Star Trek, it will only come about when human beings let go of their personal selfishness and greed. And I don't think that will ever happen. Wow. I say that to our shame, Dave. But you know what? 
as long as human beings are looking out for number one, as long as people are primarily consumed with their own wealth, and their own power, their own notoriety, there will never be a human race as was dreamed of by Gene Roddenberry. Because in order to have that type of human race, you got to put yourself aside. You, you've got to be willing to work for and invest in the collective good. It's just not going to happen. It's not, it's, not, it's not happening, and I see no indication that it will happen. You know, people, you know, I, I don't want to wax political here, but I'm going to. People idealistically espouse socialism because the idea of it is let's all throw all of our stuff in together and then share it equally. So nobody's super rich, nobody's super poor, and, and we all share what we have and we live together equally. Now let me say, Dave, that's a beautiful idea, isn't it? It's a beautiful sentiment. But guess what? It'll never work. Because there will always be people who want more for themselves. There will always be the heads of state or the people that run the government who want to live in nicer houses and want to drive fancier cars than you and want to have a bigger bank account than you. And as long as there are those human beings, there will never be a society where we just all throw everything that we have into a pile and then and then uh, distribute it equally to everybody. It's just not going to happen. I'd like it to happen. I'll be honest with you. I think that is, you can see that model in the New Testament churches in the Bible. The churches, the groups of people that were in different cities and towns that called themselves Christians, they would put all of their belongings in, in together and anyone that was in need was taken care of. But it came out of, or listen to me, it came out of their love for God. It came out of their desire to, to serve others because of their love for God, and they knew that God loved everybody, and he wanted them to give what they had to provide for everybody. It didn't come from government. You cannot pass enough laws to eliminate greed in the heart. There will never be enough legislation to eliminate selfishness or a lust for power or a lust for money, there, you pass all the laws you want. You can't legislate those, the heart of man. And as long as the heart of man is me first, looking out for me, I know what I want, I want that, I want that, that's mine, I should have that, I'm mad that he doesn't have that, or I'm, ha I'm mad that he has that because I don't have it, I want it. As long as those attitudes are inside human beings, and regret, regrettably, I would say, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't see a future like the one that Gene Roddenberry envisioned. I would love for it to be that way, but I don't think it's realistic given the heart of humanity. I'll say something about that. I lived in Japan for a number of years, and this was back in the early 90s. And the J Japanese society, my wife's Japanese, they now things have changed in that country over the decades since 1990. I lived there in 1988 till 91. Everyone there was focused on more of a common theme, a common thread, a collective consciousness or a collective community. When you come back to the United States, we're the land of independence. We are very, very individual people. I sometimes think that our individuality is almost at this point too individualized. I, I see that a lot. I see, I, I, one of the things I see is with today's technology, 
we are using it to disconnect from each other. For instance, I will tell yeah. you, I will tell you this. I, I go into coffee shops a lot when I mix my radio show. I go into coffee shops during the week. I don't disturb anyone there because I know they're all in their day jobs. The people that are there, they're on their phones or they're on their laptops. But on the <clears> weekends, I, I tried something. I went into a coffee shop. And I tried to do what I did in the 70s and the 80s and have a conversation with people I ne I'd never met just to see what kind of day they were having, to see what was on their minds, what commonality we had that we could talk about, have a cup of coffee. If you do that now, you're intruding on that person's individuality. I agree. And it, it's remarkable the way we've taken a product, our social media product, which is supposed to, the word social means we're, we're socializing with each other, we're communicating. Yeah. Yeah. Yet the social media is destroying us and making, it's making us go right or left. And there's almost, there's almost no middle. It, it's, I agree. It's, it's I agree. shockingly sad, it really, really is. I but, agree. Captain Tug, Stardate 6563.4. A nascent singularity has been reported near the uninhabited Cressida system. Approaching Cressida 2 now, sir. What the blazes? It is possible an interphasic rift has thinned the structure of space-time in this region. How long? Based on physiological age? Sixty-odd years. Two hundred and seventeen. Are you even a captain? When you have no crew. Enterprise, prepare to be towed. Scotty, get us out of here. Hold on to your bustle. We're making a run for it. Full impulse. Is the Enterprise safe? Yes, sir, she's free. All right. What's coming up next, Vic? I know that I, I was reading on your page here that you have another production working with some of the same folks. I think it's called When the Train Stops. Yes, yes, I'm What's really excited that? about this. Uh, it's a short film uh -huh. that features Mike Forrest, who played Apollo right. in our first episode. John Delancey, cute, who was in our ninth episode. And uh, our, uh, one of our producers, Lisa Hansel, who is, uh, she's the exec producer of this project. I mean, she's the big cheese of this, of this short film. And uh, I'm, I'm playing a role in it. And Kipley Brown, who is in our series, is playing a role in it. And uh, James Kerwin, who is one of, our, one of my co-producers in STC, is, is going to be directing this for, for Lisa. But very excited about it. It's... Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think you can find it. I think you can find it at where when the train stops. dot com. Uh, you can certainly look up when the train stops and and uh, and find it. Look up the website and check it out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm also working on um, several animated series right now, voicing characters in several animated series, and I'm even directing one. I'm directing an animated series called Junie Tyson, which uh, is for Funimation. Um, you can find it at Funimation.com. And uh, we've got a couple of other projects in the pipeline. I want to do another album. I want to record another record album cool. of music. And I've been meaning to do that since before I started Star Trek Continues. So now that SDC is done, maybe I'll have some time to, uh, to do that. But a lot of things going on. Uh, when, the train stop is, it, when the Train Stops is, the, is the, uh, the one that's coming up next. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. Any fear of being typecasted? A lot of a lot of actors have the fear that once they play a role that is significant to their fan base, that they will be associated with that and will be hard to break out. Now, William Shatner probably found that to be true, although he had other series. How about yourself? Because there was a prequel not to you. About that. No, not worried. Okay. I'm not worried about that. First of all, our series doesn't have any near the, anywhere near the reach that Star Trek does. Now, maybe, knock on linoleum, uh, maybe in 20 years, who knows? You know what I mean? Maybe in 10 or 20 years, Star Trek Continues will have grown to the point where people are just accepting it as part of canon. And 
you got the original series, and then you watch STC, and then you go into the motion pictures. Um, I would love that, and it would be nothing would give us more joy and honor than to be included in that. But I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it. And hey, if you got to be typecast, you know, yeah, it's not the worst thing in the world to be typecast as Captain Kirk. Right. One shallow question for you: Out of all of the captains. Which Captain Kirk, or, or, or which Captain, not which Captain Kirk, there was, uh, of course, there was Picard, there was, I right. never really watched sure. these Anyway, things. and yeah. sure, I'll... And I, then I'll give you my order of who I like. If, if you don't mind doing this, who, who did you associate most with? Who did you like as Captain of the Enterprise? Or of Voyager, or of Deep Space Nine? Well, they're, they're, I mean, Bill Shatner and Captain Kirk will far and away always be my favorite. <clears throat> After that, I would say Picard. Um, after that, I think probably Cisco is pretty cool on Deep Space Nine. And then probably, uh, Bacula really? in, Vo in uh, Enterprise. And then Janeway in Voyager. But I'll be honest with you. I really am not even in, a, in an authoritative position to say, and I'll tell you why. Because after the original series ended... And then, however many years later, um, what, 15 um, or so, maybe 12, uh, Next Generation came out. I was so excited that there was going to be more Star Trek. And I watched it, and it was okay. But it did not invoke in me the emotions that the original series did. Yeah. Now, I know that there are a lot of people out there who are younger than me. And their Star Trek was Next Generation. That was their jam. That's their jam. God bless. And then there are people out there just, you know, um, um, DS9 was their jam. Uh, that was their Star Trek. Or Voyager, or Enterprise, or Discovery, the new one. To each his own. And this, herein lies the point. To each his own. You don't fight with people because they don't like the one you like. You, you, you let them enjoy what they enjoy, just like you expect them to let you enjoy what you enjoy. I found that each of the subsequent series of Star Trek, for me, 55-year-old Vic Mignogna, for me, each one got further and further away from whatever it was that made the original series so endearing to me. I'm not sure I can even verbalize it. I don't know that I can really articulate it. But as the times changed, as social conditions changed, as attitudes changed, as technology changed, as, as we moved through time, each of the subsequent Star Trek series would reflect the time in which it was made. And I, I feel like each of them got further and further away from whatever it was that made the original series so endearing. And so I kind of lost interest in them. I watched some of DS9, and it, it was okay. And I watched some of Voyager, it was okay. I've seen some of Enterprise, it was okay. And I, I watched a good portion of Next Generation, and it was okay. But to me, it was the original series that inspired me when I was 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 years old. And that's why I made Star Trek Continues. You know, we have a caller here because I was asking some people if they would like to call in and have a discussion with you. So, Vic, we have a caller on the line. And let me turn up the volume here. And who do we have? Hi, this is Sherry from Oakland. Hi, Vic. Hi, Sherry. I'm doing good. How are things in Oakland? Okay. What is your question for you? Oh. oh, sorry about that. Maybe it's the delay of doing it the way we're doing. But if you ask the question, then then pause and then Vic will answer it for us. Uh, continues, do you think you'll ever write a book? 
civil stories to be documented. Ah, that is a brilliant, wonderful idea. I love that idea. Maybe we will. Um, maybe I will. It was an incredible experience, and there are a lot of really wonderful, endearing stories and challenges and disappointments and successes uh, along the way. And I think that might be a really cool idea, and I appreciate you even mentioning it. Um, maybe we will. Maybe we Oh, there are. There are a lot of them. I promise you. Okay, well, thank you so much for calling and talking to Vic. I, I, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Thanks. God bless Vic. God bless you, sweetie. Okay, so I, I think we're having another couple callers call in. But I'm curious, Vic, uh, when we talk about Star Trek and we talk about the characters of Star Trek, how did you match the precise individuals based upon the character? And the characters were very complex to begin with. And as you were growing the characters of these individuals, you had to obviously think about capabilities of them growing and uh, the abilities for them to grow. You, well, I, think, I, I think you mentioned some of them. You had known these actors for a while. Oh yeah, I've known I've known all of these actors. Okay. Um, I will tell you this: I never wanted to make Star Trek Continues with a bunch of strangers. Hmm. I didn't want to make it with a bunch of people that you know, a bunch of hired guns. You know what I mean? I didn't want to make it with a bunch of people that I didn't know. I wanted to make it with friends. I wanted to make it with people who I loved and people whose talents I was familiar with. And uh, and that's what I did. I mean, Todd Haberkorn is a de very dear friend. I always tease him. He's like my little brother. And, uh, and he's a great actor. And so I cast him to play a very difficult role in Spock. Chuck Huber, very dear friend, voice actor friend I've known for years, great actor here in the Dallas area. I thought he'd make a great McCoy. Um, on and on throughout the cast. And I'll tell you something, it's a very daunting challenge, Dave. Oh, yeah, sure. To play an iconic role like a Kirk or a Spock or a McCoy or even a Sulu or Chekhov or Uhura or Scotty. And those... Those characters have been so well defined and so identified with the actors that played them. Yeah, and you know that that is what was missing. You mentioned the triad, right? You had Kirk, McCoy, Spock. That is what was missing in the other episodes. Was they try to do that in uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation when they played poker? They were at the poker table. There's one episode where I, I think it was. Uh, I think it was. Picard sat down at the table and they were all surprised that he was willing to play poker. I think there was an episode with that. But there was none of the really intimate relationship where you felt that you felt with the original series, if they had never been on an Enterprise or Star Trek, you would see them hanging out at Cheers and with Sam Malone serving them alcohol beverages at the at the bar. I never yeah. really I never really got that. You had I tell you one thing is funny because you mentioned Janeway. I, I felt an emotional connection to her more than I did Picard, only because I saw her vulnerable more than Picard was. Well, there you go. So, see, it's, it's always an interpretation. And you're right, there's nothing wrong. There's no right answer to that question. No, to each, yeah, yeah. To each is them. Yeah. Lieutenant, contact Starfleet Command. From Kirk, Commanding Enterprise, Unknown entity has infiltrated ship's computer after encountering old Earth space probe Friendship 3. An intelligence. Getting more intelligent by the minute. When are we? Mid 1800s, Union, Confederacy, these uniforms are American Civil War. This doctor knows new ways to heal. What new ways? We don't trust no damn Confederate. You'll trust this Confederate, your sergeant dies. I need alcohol to clean the wound. We're running out of every damn thing in this place. We're gonna have to amputate below the knee.
Do what you gotta do. Are you out of your mind? You need to stay in bed. I miss this. That's worth getting out of bed for. How many men get to see history unfold with one of its greatest contributors? True. You're a lucky man. I am. I'll never be the man I was. You know what I think, Jim? A man with one leg can stand just as tall as any other if he has a purpose. Perhaps even taller. Yeah, I think we have another caller here. Let's bring him or her on the line. Hi, who's calling? Hi, this is Gary Brown. Hello, Nick. Oh, it's hey, Gary, Gary Brown. Hi. Hey, I have a question for you. Um, Uh, if I if I understand your your question correctly, uh, it's about our sets, about our studio. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's what we did, Garrett. Um, at the very beginning of Star Trek Continues, we partnered up with another fan production called Starship Farragut. Starship Farragut had a, a partial bridge that they had built. And, uh, and so when I came in and we partnered up, I said to Farragut, um, I will put the money in, me and Steve Dangler, we'll put the money in to, to rent a bigger building, and we'll put the money in to build all of the rest of the sets. If you guys will move your bridge over to the bigger building and then help us build we'll pay for it but if you'll help us build the rest of the set and you will be pleased to know garrett that our sound stage is exactly laid out and interconnected exactly like the original sound stage was for the original series of star trek it is all standing it's all custom made we we built every bit of it from the ground up um based on screen caps of different rooms and uh, what little diagrams we could find online. And, uh, and now we've, we've got the entire uh, soundstage, the, the, the sets all built at our studio in South Georgia. appreciate you saying that, and I must tell you, that's what I was going for. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I am so proud of Michelle for the character she created in McKenna. You know, we were talking about, Dave, we were talking about the iconic roles and how hard it would be and daunting it would be to play an iconic character, but equally as daunting would be to create a brand new character that had to hold her own with iconic characters. How do you create somebody new and inject them into the original series of Star Trek? But Michelle did a wonderful job with it, and we realized that she wasn't in the motion picture, and then we realized that a very powerful plot tool would be to have to see McKenna die, and that that might even be the the uh, that might even be the catalyst that makes Spock decide to go back to Vulcan, and maybe that's what caused Kirk 
to decide, you know, too many people have died uh, under my captaincy and I, I, I don't want to do it anymore. But, um, but when we were crafting that scene, Garrett, I was dreaming and hoping and praying that it would have the emotional impact that I was imagining it to have. And when we put the music to it, once we shot it and edited it and then put the music to it, I, I feel like it, it accomplished what we set out for it to accomplish. And I'm so glad you, I'm so glad that it moved you the way it did. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for calling. I, I, Vic, I, you know, I did want to mention one thing too, the character of McKenna. I was, yes. I, I was reading some of the inputs from some of the fans of Star Trek Continues. She was resisted in the beginning. In fact, I have to be honest, the first episodes when I was watching them, I couldn't really get a grip on her. She is the character that had some of the most character growth development of any of the characters because by as we started getting used to her maybe that's what it was there was none she was not anyone that we were used to in the original series yeah. so she was like someone what was she a what was she from lost in space was the she the zachary smith that was a stowaway right we thought she was a stowaway but as we got to know her she became a, a very important part of that cast i felt that probably from five going forward I don't know. Well, what the, let me uh, let me let me let me say something about that. Okay, sure. When when Michelle and I were talking about what character she would play, and I said, "Well, you could play Nurse Chapel, or you could play Yeoman Rand," and then we started talking about what was in Next Generation that wasn't in the original series. Because I did want to start bridging the gap between the two series. For instance, the holodeck, or maybe some upgrades in the phasers or communicators or you know, little things here and there to basically say, this is where we're going and we're moving in that direction. <clears throat> and immediately what came to mind was, well, there was a ship's counselor in Next Generation that there was not in the original series. Well, when did they start? That was standard procedure in Next Generation. When did they start that? And we decided we would create the first experimental ship's counselor program, and we would bring this counselor on board. And ironically, you remember how you said that a lot of people resisted her? Do you remember how Kirk responded to her? He resisted her too. Okay. Was that the, he was, was that he, was, the, he was dismissive of her. Captain yeah. Kirk represented the audience. He was dismissive of her. He didn't really see like why she needed to be there. And he was he was dismissive. And in episode two, they butted heads a little bit and were argumentative a little bit. But in episode four. It's McKenna who counsels Kirk about dealing with these ghosts from his past. And at the end of that episode, McKenna comes down into the bridge at the very end of the episode. She comes onto the bridge and says to Kirk, thank you so much for approving my request for an office. And Kirk says, if I ever had any reservations about the needs for a, sh a need for a ship counselor, I don't anymore. And that was the point where Kirk himself acknowledged that she had a purpose and that, that she was being welcomed in as part of the crew. And Michelle continued to grow in that character to the point where when episode 11 comes along and, and you see her die it's very emotional and then to me one of the most beautiful moments was when kirk is sitting in admiral nagura's office and nagura says based on your experiences during the time she was on board your ship 
how would you rate the experimental ships counselor program? And Kirk said, a success. A success. Yep, I it remember. Sh clearly. It should continue. So Kirk's like basically given the green light for what would eventually become Deanna Troy and the regular ships counselor program on all the ships. So um, I'm very proud of, of having created that character and Michelle having created and, and, and executed that character so well. And I know, I know that there were people out there like, what do we need her for? We got McCoy and, and she, she's pointless and Vic only did that because she's Vic's fiance. You know what? Live and let live. Remember what I said a little while ago? Okay, to each his own. If you didn't like her, God bless you. That's fine. A lot of people did. And so uh, I'm very pleased with how it turned out. Captain, readings indicate the colony has been destroyed. Romulan plasma weapon. You're in charge? Captain James T. Kirk, Federation Starship Enterprise. Commander, he needs your help. I need your help was an imposter. An imposter who's now on the loose. You know what? What I think created that extra magic in there, you're still there, Vic? Yes. Oh, okay. I think what created that magic with McKenna was she was not accepted in the beginning and the growth of her character, obviously since she was brand new, it's, it's almost like when you get something brand new that you didn't want. And then eventually when you start to read the features of it and how to use it and where it plugs into your life, that that product becomes almost something you say, my God, thank God, thank God I've got that. And to be honest with you, she bypassed in my, my, my opinion. I, I connected with her more than I did with Counselor Troy of Star Trek, the next generation, just, just from my personal viewpoint. Well, I think there is an, an extra element of McKenna knowing that she's the odd man out. Yeah. There's there's the element of Dr. McKenna coming on to a deep space exploration vehicle, knowing that no one's ever done this before, and not knowing how it's going to go, or whether she's going to be received, or whether she even is going to be of any value, and and then seeing her grow into it. You know, with 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 Counselor Troy, she was there because she was supposed to be there. And there so, was never any. Yeah. There was never any question about her uh, qualifications or her belonging on the Enterprise. But with McKenna, there was. She needed to prove herself to Kirk and 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 the rest of the crew. And I think she did. Yeah, she she was like she was naturally appealing as time progressed. Whereas I guess Counselor Troy, when I watched it, it was like she was she was almost like an egotistical person where she, she had an advantage because she could read minds because she was right. So it was almost like she had the upper hand on anyone in that crew. And, and the counseling aspect was something was like, I understand you because I'm in your mind. I, 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 I'm, I'm reading you. So we have another caller here. Let's get to who this is. Let me take them off of speakerphone and bring them in here. Put it up close to your speaker so I can hear what they're saying. Okay. I, I, let's see. Hang on, let me press the right button here. And I probably only have time for this. This is probably about all the time I have left for. Okay, hi, who's on the call and who, what was the question for Vic? Hey Dave, can you hear me? Yeah, I sure I do. Can hear. I'm sorry, who is it? It's Lady Catherine. Oh, it's one of my listeners, Lady Catherine from my Hello, music. Hello, Lady Catherine. Hi, okay Vic, I just want to say something. It's not really a question. Um, I grew up is uh, in the same area as William Shatner, and I must yeah. say that if anybody in this world could have portrayed or done this as William would have wanted, it's you. Oh, I hope that's true. You are awesome, and your, your, your passion and your compassion is just like William. I am honored. And you know what, Catherine, the next time I see Bill, I'm going to tell him you said that. I'm going to tell him that, that I met this lady on a talk show 
named Lady Catherine, and she said she grew up with you and that you were a kind and compassionate person, and uh, and I'm sure he would be very, be very glad to hear that. And I'm honored and humbled. Vicky, you know, can I tell you a story? Sure. time frame, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if he remembers that, and I will promise you I will ask him about it. Well, you know what? He just said that, got up and walked away, and said nothing more. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, are you still in the Montreal area? Uh, no, right now I'm living near Toronto. Well, next time I do an event appearance, like at the Fan Expo in Toronto, or something up there. I hope you'll come and say hello in person. Oh, I would love to. And, and again, your heart, your compassion, everything about you is so very much connected to William. Thank you. Well, he had a huge impact on me through his portrayal of Kirk when I was a little boy. My parents had just my parents had just divorced, and I, my mom and I lived in an apartment by ourselves. My dad was gone, and I would just watch this amazing man who was brave and kind and 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 led his ship and and took care of his friends and went on these adventures and and he was very much a father figure and to me when I was a little boy. So I'm very honored to hear that. Thank you. Exactly that in person. Thank you. Although he was a prankster. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Catherine, for calling. Let me, thank you, let me thank you so much, Lady Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lady Catherine, for calling. Take care. Okay. Take care. Love you. So, Vic, let me make a formal introduction to you, or or an or a, uh, invitation to you, that when you have some new music to come out, now that you know I do a radio show focused on music. Let's get you on from a music perspective, okay? okay? Sounds like a deal. Sounds like a deal. Thank you yeah. so much for joining the show. I was really connected to you, watching the series. All of your fans very much appreciated every episode that you worked out. I loved it. It was it was passionate. It was what I wanted to see. I love you for coming on the show. And thanks so much for being part of the show that we did together. I appreciate this so Thank much. You, my Thank, friend. You. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. All the best. Have a good night. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We just completed uh, the final shot uh, from our final episode. And this will be the last time I put on the uniform of Captain Kirk. I want to thank all of you. All of you supporters, friends, family, people enthusiastic about what we have done at Star Trek Continues. Um, we certainly have been inspired and energized by your love and your support and your kindness towards our production. So from all of us here at Star Trek Continues, we wish you the very best. May the wind 
be ever at your backs and live long and prosper, each and every one of you. God bless you.